everybody and welcome to our third international episode of our podcast Millennials. I hope you have already got it that we talk about current topics of our generation and one of them is, is of course studying and living abroad. Today we are going to talk about this topic with a millennial, Hugo Valent. Well Hugo, if we called you here today to be in our podcast, that means that you did something special in your life. But please just know that you are not the first one or the last one to do this on this planet, okay? <laughs> yes, Kaki, I can only agree. And we would like to mention one very special Slovakian, a small big man called Milan Rastislav Štefanik, who celebrated, well, we celebrated very recently, a hundred years since his death. Milan Rastislav Štefanik was a man who was at his time uh, out of standard, we could say that, because he was a traveler with an amazing international career, coming from one of the smallest countries of the world, Slovakia, just like Hugo, Kaki and I. <laughs> we could say that he was pretty ugly, but women loved him for some reason. And also, some, well, almost all of the diplomats from the world loved him, especially in France. He studied in Sarvaš, which is in Hungary, in Prague, Zurich and Paris. I guess the three of us are not that special, though we all studied <laughs> abroad, but <laughs> Stefanik started more than a hundred years ago. He visited USA, Latin America, Africa, Asia, Australia, Brazil, Ecuador, Morocco, Tunis, Russia, well, many countries, and I really don't feel like listing all of them. And, uh, I mean, you guys, you know, it's a, uh, it was a little different. It's not like nowadays that you can uh, jump on a plane and go someplace in a few hours. There was no plane, no taxi, no Uber. Well, uh, perhaps there was a bicycle. Uh, so he had to travel many days and weeks. He died when he was 38, and by the, by the age of 38, he traveled he traveled around the world twice. But uh, yeah, he was not just f***ing around. <laughs> he was doing some meaningful work. He was a discoverer, adventurer, military general, diplomat, and magician. And he also invented suspenders. <laughs> so without Milan Rastislav Stefanik, all of us would be running around naked like some kind of caveman. So yeah, that is him. In the nutshell. <laughs> yes, Dennis, you're totally right. All in all, and we could say he was a millennial of his generation, an excellent politician, diplomatic, soldier, scientist, p uh, pilot, photographer, traveler, who died in a plane crash under as yet unclear circumstances. Ooh, conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> and today, in our new episode, we are welcoming Stefanik's follower, Hugo Valent, from before a so-called Eastern Bloc, a representative of a generation of millennials, which can travel nowadays very easily, even though I could say our wings have been cut short recently. So, Hugo, hello, nice to meet you. Hi, thank you for having me, and uh, I'm sorry for my headphone falling off and for my puppy pain making noises. Um, also, the yeah, the introduction you have made, uh, yeah, that's that's I I wouldn't ever dare to compare myself to Stefanik, but uh, but you're kind to do it, and yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's he's certainly a major major personality in our history, and, and so big that actually there's a there's a bridge in Lyon called the uh, Stefanik's Bridge, yes, right, Kaki? Yes, you live in Lyon. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> So Hugo, I'm very excited to see you because Dennis told me a lot of things about you. And so you were Dennis' classmate from Spanish bilingual high school several, several years ago, <laughs> but you didn't finish it. You went to Italy. Please explain me, <laughs> how did you get to Italy from a Spanish bilingual high school? Having seen the international environment of the bilingual high school, I was, and also growing up, I, I was just really interested in, in the world in general, and I wanted to meet people from, from different countries and different cultures. And um, that's probably what motivated me in the first place to go to the bilingual high school in Slovakia, and that's probably what uh, then kind of took my interest when I saw a leaflet, essentially, on, on, on sort of the class board. Um, uh, that said, hey, there is a project or a school or whatever. Uh, that that was my thinking back then. That um, you know gets people from essentially, oh, well, from many countries in the world and puts them into one place for two years. And you study together. You finish the last two years of your high school and get your high school diploma. And the point is that you get to know them. You get to make friendships from from people who who 
you didn't grow up around and then um, that way you probably can sort of combat your own prejudices that you might have or, or just genuinely uh, learn a lot of new things and that sounded amazing to me and I was like that's exactly the kind of environment I would like to be in um, and I didn't particularly care where it was I it, it, if it was if it had been in Slovakia I would have been happy to stay I, <laughs> I didn't really my goal wasn't to move away my goal was to get to that environment regardless of in the world where it was and so I ended up being selected for Italy and it was really nice a good fit okay so it wasn't your plan to leave Slovakia you just uh you just took the opportunity yeah yeah I just wanted that environment and it mm. wasn't available in Slovakia so mm. uh, it's a pity this is quite interesting because me too I live in France right now and I before I went to USA in Australia and my plan wasn't either to go abroad or just leave Slovakia it I don't think it's a shitty country or something like that. I just, you know, I just took every opportunity that I that I had in Slovakia or in the other countries and I just build my life from these opportunities and now I'm in France and when people are asking me like are you coming to Slovakia? I'm like, "No, I'm not coming back, but it's it's not because I don't like this country. Just my life is somewhere else right now." So Uh, I can relate to that as well because I was very happy in Slovakia. I'm from from a small city and I was happy there. I had my family, my friends. Everything I wanted was in one place. So it was a great place to be. But then I got a, like the chance to go to Spain. And I was like, yeah, why not? You know, uh, I'm young. I have all the possibilities and I can do this. And so many people would be perhaps wishing to do this and they couldn't. So if I could, why wouldn't I do it? Yes. Uh, Hugo, to get in a Slovak high school or a bilingual high school, it's very general and quite vague. Basically, anyone who can choose uh, correctly for a multiple choice question can, can get in and they might not even have the the right motivation to study, you know, at that high school. Do you think is this is the right way to do this or was it the same to get in your school in Italy or was it different? Mm, yeah, that's a very important question. Uh, it's it's a challenge really to talk about high school admissions in part because it's a very it's a young age so you don't it's hard to judge people's abilities and and potential especially potential from a set of grades from a set of numbers and from one time performance on a test that you take. Uh, especially if the education system does not spend years preparing students for a stressful exam like that, which covers, you know, not just one year of, of or not, not just one semester of stuff, um, like we have like the six month semesters in Slovakia, but but that covers your entire basically everything you learned up to that point in your car- educational career. So no, I mean it, the, the the high school admission system is is, is not good in Slovakia but I, I know nothing about how to I, I I wouldn't dare to say how to improve it other than I can say that the assessment for the high school in Italy um, which is a part of this international organization called UWC is much more holistic so they look at not just your grades which of course should be should not be bad meaning you shouldn't be like um, anyway shouldn't be falling behind But but you don't have to have the top of the top grades. That's not the point either. But it's a holistic approach, right? So they look at your grades. They look at your extracurricular activities because uh, they say a lot about how you value your time. Um, they look at um, some of the like engagement you have had in your local community um, because many kids do. They either help out at home or they help out at, at um, some NGOs or in church or whatever. There is just so much that that kids do that shows their character more uh, than just the numbers that they get from their uh, prior education. So I think the holistic approach is better, but but I don't have an exact answer as to what to do. Mm. But um, what did you have to do as part of the uh, admission process for UWC? UWC? It's kind of like UWC. What does it stand for? Because WC is a shortcut for toilet. United Toilet. <laughs> United yes, good, good, good point. Good point. <laughs> No, I'm joking. I, I believe it's it's a, one of the most prestigious uh, institutions. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, what was the admission procedure? Did you have to present some kind of motivation letter, uh, something that would reflect your personality? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the it's it's United World College, 
which the college is kind of high school, but not university, like uh, in, in some English speaking countries. But uh, yeah, the United World part is kind of the one that reflects the mission and the college as well at the end. But yeah, anyway, so the admissions process was, was let's say, multi-step, right? So, so first was, yeah, submit like an application with all the standard personal information and, and grades, but then also write three essays or two essays. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, w- one of them on like a social topic, something about like the current affairs in society and what's like an answering a prompt. One of them about uh, like your previous experience and what you learned from your previous experience. And then the third one, uh, I can't quite remember. And maybe there isn't a third one, but there is definitely two, at least two essays about one page to two pages that you have to write. Uh, oh, maybe the third one is actually like a short excerpt in English because all of the schools teach in English at this point in time anyway. Um, the, yeah, so they... There wasn't a, like a strict requirement that you had to know English, but uh, you should have shown at least some basic understanding of English because, again, it, everything was kind of like holistic. So if you, you know, fit the category, if you fit what they were looking for in most categories, but you didn't speak English very well, that's fine because they can teach you English at the high school. Okay. They were rather looking for your personality fit yes. than, uh, than, uh, than some... Uh... I don't know, mathematic skills or language skills or, or anything similar. That, that's pretty interesting because in my opinion, I think this is much better approach, uh, compared to what we have in Slovakia with the admission. You know, uh, I think this is better. I, or I, what I find interesting about it is that, um, they value your personality, your personal motivations, your personal approach towards things. And, uh, then they're trying to fit your, uh, characteristics. To, to mm-hmm. the message of the school. And maybe, exactly. maybe I would like to ask what was the message of the school? Yeah, the message was to be open to the idea that education can be a force to unite people and cultures. Essentially, what that means is that you shouldn't assume that you know everything at the age of 16 about what a person who grew up in uh, even the country next door from you is like. And that you, and that there is a lot to learn and that in some ways it's, it's a very clear, it's a very, let's say, balanced message that Mm. says, you know, there is, there is two sides to every story. It's an idea that, that gives the opportunity to everyone to sort of talk about what their views and values are, even if they are from conflicting backgrounds. Uh, two people are from conflicting backgrounds or historically in a conflict. But at the same time, it, 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 it definitely suggests that, that, that just that is not enough, that, that there is a clear way to live in peace. And that is by meeting and, and being next to people who are different from you. That diversity is the key among other things, of course. But that, yeah, but so, so essentially it's the message is quite, let's say, in like globalistic and let's say, on the liberal side of what mainstream politics are now, but but at the same time, it's a very much of a vision that is focused on human rights. And okay, so I'm going to put it in a much more tangible words. I'm kind of saying a lot of words that are puffy, but not necessarily specific. So I suppose the it's hard a bit to summarize the mission, but I think what I would say is that as long as you don't make an effort to understand people who are different from you, Mm-hmm. You are not gonna make the wor- this world a more peaceful place. Okay, so you would say that the or if we could summarize it, would the say or oh, would the school rather focus on similarities than the differences? Because when we talked about this uh, some time ago uh, with you, Hugo, you said something very interesting, and you said that at the end of the day, you, you kind of realize that ninety five percent of your tasks or of your life. You, you live it exactly the same way as uh, any other culture. Like you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you eat, you sleep, you encounter mainly the same problems. So w- would this be the, the main focus of the school? Like let's approach our differences from a friendly way and uh, let's focus on what, what we have in common. And uh, from there, let's pick up what we do not have in common. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and thank you. You're actually reminding me of, of the word that I wanted to use. <laughs> it humanizes mm. people who disagree with you. Yeah. Because so often in, in, in today's world, or the easiest way you can hate people is if you dehumanize them. If you just say they are a number, if you just say they are not like you or that they are worse than you. Um, 
But if you, exactly, so the focus on the similarities is what humanizes people, makes you realize that everyone complains about homework, everyone um, has trouble during the day, sometimes people have bad roommates, good roommates, like we all have very similar issues for the most part. But that is not to say that actual big problems are brushed away. They are not, but you're just, you just feel a lot more comfortable in a way to, to talk about after a day of seeing how similar you are. It's a, it's a bit more easier to then sit down and talk out some really, really contentious topic that people have long suffered from because you know you are safe. You know the other person is not going to come after you. They're not going to be vindictive. They're not going to be, you know, you're not going to experience the same level of, let's say, insecurity you might have experienced when you were back home in a situation that the other side was coming after you. Okay. So you said that uh, the school had students coming from all over the world, like many, many, many countries. Do you think that some countries are excluded for some specific motives? Or is it just solely that the program is open to any country, but uh, the countries decide not to participate? Like I, I can, I think I can come up with a good example, like North Korea. I cannot imagine that North Korean government would allow their students to, to you know, uh, go abroad and participate in such a program. Could you set some, maybe you could shed some light <laughs> into this? Oh, it's an excellent question. Um, I don't think I have an answer to what the regimes like North Korea do. I, uh, well, I do know that. Uh, <laughs> oh, actually, a matter of fact, I do have an answer. So I just don't want to misspeak. But, um, but so I believe, and you can find this, I believe, in the news. Um, one of the members of the rulers of North Korea, I think Kim Jong-un's, I believe either a cousin or aunt, her daughter or or son went to UWC, the one in Bosnia. And it's pretty crazy. Um, and it, it, there was also, actually, there was also a news report, and I'm sure you will find, which talked about that kind of a, that person not not the same person that studied at the UWC but also but probably their mom or something in North Korea saying that that she wants to kind of bring that sort of a message home in a way as funny as that sounds for a country that <laughs> is a dictatorship but anyway so so yes so there had well I know of one for sure that North Korea had you know sent to a, a school like this but again I don't know about other isolated sort of dictatorship countries um i can tell you that well there is about 20 uwcs around the world and everyone in each country uh, tries to understand the local let's say history and then usually the the makeup of the students reflects the local history so for example the one in bosnia and herzegovina has quite a bit of uh people from the different balkan countries precisely because of their history in, in, in the Balkans. Then the one in Italy is at the border of Slovenia and uh, also very close to Austria. So And it used to be a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, so it, it's set up there because it's kind of bridging like the East and the West. It's taking Austrians, Italians, Slovenians, and people from different parts of Europe uh, who are also kind of east-west maybe divide and also people from the rest of the world. But I think at the one in Italy, you will find more Europeans than, for example, at the one in, in Singapore, where you will find probably people from, you know, Hong Kong and China, you know, contentious issue right now. Yeah, so every single school kind of makes up the students based on the local history, but but it's but it's never more than like 20, 30 percent. Anyway, it, it, I actually don't know. So I, I think for about 90 students in one class year, there is about 70 countries represented. It's actually really interesting that so many different people can live together on that campus, where, mm -hmm. how you said 70 countries, and they can live together and get along pretty well. Mm -hmm. It's it bringing me back to Slovakia, for example, that at least at my city, I feel like people are sometimes still shocked when they see people of different skin or like of a different nation. And I don't want to talk about a situation if I would bring a black boyfriend, for example, at home, like I think that all grandmothers would talk about it, the whole Gayari village would talk about it. And I feel that we are still kind of learning, you know, to, to accept this approach because it's still something exotic for us and it's not a standard. 
And uh, also when I was 15, I did a small exchange in France where I spent a week with my correspondent and I, then I brought her uh, in Slovakia. She was a black girl and we experienced some racist comments. So it, it, it wasn't pleasant at all. And I have another story that's quite a funny one that four years ago I brought my French French uh, ex-boyfriend, at the time boyfriend, and I brought her to my grandma. And as he had a beard... Uh, my grandmother directly thought that he was a Muslim, so she was like, "Oh my gosh, I served you a meat, but you can't eat meat." And and it was really funny for me, so I was laughing, but he was kind of upset because my grandmother she thought that he was a Muslim. So yeah, it's uh, the the Slovak example. I mean, like we were we were very isolated, and we were isolated to to anything foreign up to like nineties, early nineties. Uh, which is like, but on the other hand, you, ha- you have this, this example that we have quite a big Vietnamese mi- minority living in Slovakia, right? And, uh, there's no problem with that. So I, I really think that it's, it's literally what you said, Hugo, that the UWC's approach in uh, finding the similarities and not focusing on differences is absolutely relevant because how, how is it that we can coexist with no issues with the Vietnamese people? But the, the moment somebody of other race comes to Slovakia, even nowadays, that there's some kind of problem. Yeah. I mean, t- to me, the answer is, is really clear. It's, it's a failure of, of political leadership and it's a failure of the, also the private sector who are doing better, but, but really the political leadership scapegoats people of, especially of, um, Islamic background. They, uh, they ostracize and demonize people of darker skin who are fleeing violence and persecution around the world. And they they are using it to gain political points from 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 voters, primarily. But also, I believe they just def, some many of them genuinely believe these uh, hateful, racist ideas to be true. Um, and they, I mean, yeah, I mean, to me, that's that's quite clear. I think that the, the issue, well, that's the issue. Yeah, it's a fault of or it's a failure of our education system as well. Because I know, I, I know, and I don't want to name and shame, but I know a, a personal uh, example when uh, the teacher was actually agreeing and igniting uh, racist comments and uh, some, some racist notions. And it was a high school teacher. And uh, if, if you, you know, like the high school teacher, to some degree, it is an authority. And he, if he has around 20, 30 pupils, like those young minds, they're going to catch something in their receptors, you know, and it's definitely not okay. But... I mean, we should maybe leave this <laughs> sad and um, tragic topic. Yeah, I would like to ask you, because we all have some kind of experience with Slovak millennials and how they are when they're abroad. Like, how do they behave? Do they adapt easily? Do they stick together? Because in my experience, the Slovaks were always together. For me, it was also the case. Like, I had many Slovakian friends and we would we would hang out together. But slowly, I was more reaching out to the internationals because if I wanted to be with Slovakians, I would stay in Slovakia. So, how do you perceive uh, Slovak uh, millennials when they're abroad? I suppose the impression I have gotten is that, yes, generally, people of my age try to stick together. And, but I think that kind of happens to, to most people when they are abroad. I, I think that... What perhaps is, is, I have noticed is that they do make a bit of a, uh, let's say, an effort to, you know, speak the language where they are uh, visiting. They, they are a lot more open to the idea of learning the local language. Uh, they tend to have an easier time learning another language in part because, you know, we all grow up kind of picking up on Czech at least. Um, and I, so sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but I also feel like I think that for Slovakians, it's, it's quite easy. To pick up any language because we have so many sounds in our alphabet. We have s, sh, z, j, j, b, l, r, like whatever sounds you can imagine, and hence the pronunciation is much easier because in Fran- in French, Italian, or or Spanish, I don't know about Portuguese, but I know that you don't pronounce the the letter H, so they have they have difficulty saying how and uh, you know however. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's a little bit of um, observation. Okay, and one last one on the on the UWC. Well, actually, maybe we already answered this one. I was just wondering how would you compare the educational systems? Well, the, the education system actually is, is quite similar in terms of like it's a private IB diploma, international baccalaureate, and IB is taught in Bratislava at least at two different schools, I think. So you can take the IB or in Vienna, uh, you can you can take the IB. It's, it's the same. It's same. It's the same everywhere in the world. Um, 
but what you don't and the reason is that UWC the reason UWC has it is because precisely it's everywhere in the world the same so it's really easily recognizable so that you know when people finish the school they can go home and have it recognized instead of you know going home with an Italian diploma and you know I don't know you come to even Slovakia with an Italian high school diploma and they might have some quite a few trouble to actually like place you somewhere and you know imagine if you are from a small island somewhere in the Pacific Ocean I mean Mayot <laughs> we just had a, in our previous episode we had a Miss Mayot so <laughs> when he said small small island this one is in uh, Indian Ocean I was like Mayot so yeah so then yeah you can take that you can take that same diploma anywhere um so yeah, it's it's quite similar in that regard but yeah you don't get the diversity of the students and the extracurricular activities and and support you get at UWC. But uh, okay, so as as far as the as the subjects uh, that you've studied, is it the same? Is it mathematics, biology, or did you have something more more interesting like like political science or? No, you could choose environmental sciences. I think that was one of the courses they offer. But otherwise, no, I did the same. I did math, physics. What else? Economics. Oh, I said I think I have economics. Yeah, that's not traditionally taught at mm. Slovak high schools, but you can take it in some. Yeah, I had it in Spain. I, mm. I studied economics. Yeah, okay. But the rest of the same languages and yeah, that that's it. You can take theater. <laughs> that's perfect. I would love yeah. to get credits for, for attending a theater class. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right on. Moving to our second large topic would be the migration of Slovaks abroad, especially young <laughs> young Slovaks. So we'll go. Uh, just to give a little bit of context to our listeners, especially our foreign listeners, our friends from abroad, uh, Slovakia is experiencing, uh, or experiences yearly a huge number of high school graduates that leave the university and go abroad for either work or further studies. But also around 15% of young Slovaks leave the Slovakia as soon as they graduate high school. And, and not only those that graduated high school, because all three of us, Kaki, Hugo and I, we didn't even finish high school in Slovakia. I have, I have, uh, we, and that means that we don't hold a uh, Slovak high school diploma. I don't know. Do you hold, do you hold Slovak high school diploma? Hugo? No, no, me neither. I hold, I hold Spanish. Kaki holds, uh, French. So yeah, I don't, I don't think the three of us would be actually even taken into account in the statistics. <laughs> so, uh, but back to the, back to the numbers and back to the facts. Uh, well, facts. Slovakia actually has a, an estimated number of 300,000 people that are aged under 30 that left Slovakia in past 15 years, which might not seem as much, but with the population of Slovakia, which is approximately 5 million, this is almost, what, 7%? So we're, we're getting very close to 10% of the population being out. And it's the, it's the, the working population, the, the population mm-hmm. that is, that is a uh, capital making. So, do you, Hugo, can you explain us? Because you quite you you work quite closely with data. You have very good uh, overview or very good knowledge in in general economy, etc. Why do you think this is happening? Why are so many Slovaks leaving? Yeah, I think the the reason it's happening is um, complicated, and I know that's not the answer you wanted, but I can <laughs> I can. <laughs> it's a layered I, answer, definitely. <laughs> it's a layered answer because I think different people have different motivations. And um, and I really, well, one thing I can tell you that I think I have seen from the data that I have seen one person's opinion uh, is that it's not because of money. Um, I think it's, it's a very re- reductionist perspective to assume that anyone who moves away from Slovakia to a, let's say, Western European country is just after a higher salary um, because... Well, especially because young people don't consider, I think young people are often busy thinking about how to gain experiences, how to see the world, how to, how to make things, how to experience new things. And, and oftentimes money is the problem. So not necessarily, so, so moving abroad just for money will not will solve the problem but will not enable you to, to to explore new things as much as if you find a way to do both and that's the impossible thing i think uh, as like young people face is like you have no money but you have a lot of time and you want to go out and do things but you also have no money so you can't um 
it's a vicious circle. <laughs> it's a vicious circle, yeah. And and people find ways, like like um yeah, you either go and work somewhere for a bit and, and save up, or you work in Slovakia, save up and then you go or so anyway, so then or people take up job opportunities for a year or two, save up and then they travel or, or anyway, there's just a number of ways to do that. And I think then the the brain drain or the, the people leaving Slovakia in their productive age are in part going to experience the world especially now that in the EU you can travel easily and, and sort of live around. They are going to experience um, a different way of living that is, that, is, that is not as, let's say, that doesn't require as much conformity. I think in Slovakia we really appreciate and value conformity. Teachers often say just, you know, listen to me, I'm right, this is how it is, don't question it too much. And I don't think outside the box, yeah. And not not all of them do, and it's, I think it's declining this trend, and, and especially younger teachers are, are are getting quite good about having more open conversations. But but yeah, I think people, especially young people, you know, we tend to like to have different answers for different questions and see who's right and make up our own mind. And just being told what's right doesn't feel the the best. Can you imagine uh, living in Slovakia? Would you would you consider coming back to Slovakia, Hugo, or or do you see yourself abroad? Absolutely, I would. I, my, my main issue is the lack of diversity. I mean, it's uh, if I think about my kids growing up in a, in a place that that you know they only see one kind of people the whole time. I mean, it's not good. Uh, it, that's not what the world looks like, um, and it's not how in this interconnected world you build a strong economy. And that was my second point: is that. I think the issue of, of brain drain is a problem to the extent that qualified people and it, of, of all skill levels are leaving an economy, right? But I think uh, uh, perhaps just as big of a problem is that we don't have a migration policy that will allow qualified people from other parts of the world to come to Slovakia, in part because maybe they are fleeing violence, persecution, or just looking for a better salary, but also in part because they might be the same young people um, that that are also uh, uh, just like other Slovaks are looking for, you know, better salary or are fleeing discrimination at, at home. They might be also just young people who just want to live in Slovakia because it's cool for them. And that's the thing that I learned abroad is that in Slovakia, I always thought, yeah, Slovakia is not super cool. No one really cares. Yeah, it's 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 like that until you meet someone from... Japan or East Timor or, or or even from Turkey and they are like oh my goodness like Slovakia is so interesting it's got this and this and that and you know like that that's the thing that I learned is that people want to come to Slovakia and Slovakia is actually a really nice place to live <laughs> and uh, yeah so so also like like even the things that we we find we find ugly or you know like like are very very common for us like like communistic buildings or communistic <laughs> art like for them it's absolutely fascinating and we find it ugly you know and and these like like people from from west find it fascinating I wanted to say, Hugo, that when we talked about this topic before doing this episode, we concluded that a huge part in this that people, like young people, decide to go abroad, uh, play the parents. You know, that it really depends on how they bring you up, maybe whether uh, you dare to go out of your comfort zone, how you said before, whether you're independent enough. Was this also... An impulse for you, like, are, were your parents, you know, like, not really like pushing, but like talking to you, you know, like, you have to go abroad, you have to discover this and that? Yes, absolutely. My mom uh, and my father both were, were very supportive and talked a lot about the importance of gaining an international perspective. So, yeah, they were instrumental in bringing me up with that sort of open mind or trying to, you know, give me that, that open minded approach to, um, Life. So it wasn't because you think that the quality of schools in Slovakia is bad that you decided to live abroad, right? Yeah, correct. It wasn't because of that. I, I was planning on going to a Slovak university. I was already looking them up when I was sort of in high school um, in my uh, first or second year. Because my brother is seven years older, so I had some exposure to when he was choosing university. So yeah, no... I. I mean, I knew it wasn't a great education, 
on the international scale, but I did know that that a university in Slovakia would, you know, significantly improve my life in Slovakia. So yeah, I didn't have particular distaste for it. Oh, that's great. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna just chip in uh, with some other perspective that I've actually read in an article uh, from a uh, it was an interview with one of I don't remember which program, but it was a program director from the Slovak University of Technology (SDU), uh, and she said that the well, she pinpointed that talented people are going abroad. Maybe it was something specific for that program because I don't I don't personally feel like that's the case. I I just just to say that. I don't consider myself the talented guy who went abroad. You know, I I know so so many more people who are much more intelligent and much more uh, skillful than I am, and decided to stay in Slovakia. That is, uh, but that is, I I think that your grandmother thinks that you're the most talented person in the world. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. My babka loves me above everything. You did. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't know about you too, but I consider myself quite a dumbass, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm definitely not the talent that my grandmother thinks that I, I went abroad and I'm killing it. Uh, <laughs> but this program director, she was saying that the, the fact that talented people are leaving kind of lowers uh, the natural and healthy competition among mm-hmm. the students. Mm-hmm. And also, since the schools, they need to meet some quotas, right? They need to, they need to admit yearly some number of students just to keep the programs running so they're also lowering their entry requirements uh, which means that to some universities you can maybe get uh, easier and uh, that comes back to to the fact of what we said earlier that you might not even have the the best motivation which is still okay but you might not have the best motivations or or um, uh, reasons for applying to the um, to that particular program so uh, do you think this is the case Google do you think that Really, only the talented ones uh, are leaving Slovakia. No, I don't consider myself. I wouldn't class myself as a tal- talented person. <laughs> I really don't. I never thought of myself that way. And and I think this probably sounds very privileged because I think when some people look at my past education, they assume that I am maybe or maybe not. I don't know. But I think. But when I look at some other people, I also think they are, and I, they probably feel the same that they are not. No, no. I I mean. Uh, I think I know who you're talking about and I have a very high respect for her so I don't want to disagree with her statements just sort of out of context but um, a lot of people yeah again it comes back to different people have different reasons for leaving and I think people would stay if they had if the environment was just a bit more complex in Slovakia whether whether because of diversity or because of interconnectedness with the world uh, and I mean ec- economic interconnectedness, like companies. And there is always already some level of that, but companies that you know operate in different markets or cash flows, like here in London, where you have um, you know the, the Bank of England managing huge sums of money and the city in general. So the, the, you know the, those kinds of things they bring different people. They they make the city pulse. But yeah, so I I don't think. I won't know how to comment on lowering the the university requirements for people because of because of lack of what that professor perceives to be talented people. Uh, but what I do know is that we have an issue in Slovakia with university degrees generally being over emphasized and underappreciated. So a bachelor's degree is not really accepted in in sort of m- well, it's looked down upon, essentially. And master's degree is like the baseline for getting hired, which is a lot of resources that the state education needs to put into every individual uh, in order for them to then essentially generate the money back, right? Because we pay taxes and that's how we make up the money for the government's investment into us in the form of education and, and, and uh, health care. Just to say for, for our, our listeners that um, public education in Slovakia is for free, even the universities. We don't have, yeah. to, we don't have to pay for it. And health care is free. Yeah, health care is free too. Uh, but do you think uh, that overall the uh, quality of Slovak universities is decreasing? I don't know. I would have to see the data, but I do see some universities advancing in the international rankings, so that's good. But I think on average, it's probably not a very good. The data is probably quite not good. Okay, and then to this, <laughs> as, as we as we talked about it, uh, we got another 
perspective from one of our friends, also creators of this podcast, who is a professor at one of uh, Slovak universities. Uh, and he gave us a different uh, perspective. He said that when their university or the university where he teaches uh, offered its students an opportunity and opportunity to go abroad, only the bare minimum of students have actually uh, taken this opportunity. And uh, interestingly, he said that many of them were like, meh, well, whatever, I can go to that country whenever I want, I can go there for vacation, I don't really need to go there to live or stay a, a year or two or half a year. I don't know. What do you think that, what do you think, or like, why is this, this, this attitude that you have the opportunity plus you will get the financial aid making it possible for you to go abroad, but people are just not interested? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and it's probably a number of reasons as with many things in life. Uh, and my guess would be that there is a lack of attractiveness of the program that was presented to them. And I think it's only really well illustrated by let's say american universities well let's just look at the ivy league ones they or the top top ranking that was the famous ones they do so much advertising to specific high schools to specific groups of young people to specific cities to specific communities that then draw the demand for that university and therefore for their programs summer schools blah, blah 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 none of that really happens in slovakia and i think well at least some of the offers that i have seen for projects it, it that doesn't really happen because they are state funded there is no budgets for that kind of marketing so i think it, it it's probably about what are you what we you know it's a market at the end of the day what is the supply like and is it interesting enough for the students to say yeah i'm going to go away from my family for a year at an age where i you know can even cannot even do my laundry and uh right because that's the reality like you have to you have to kind of take into account that it's a big step for them but then they might not get they might get the money they might not get the advice like how are they going to what about the language i think there is just a lot of barriers that unless you have the marketing to to say you know look we this is the program come to finland we are gonna the slovak government is gonna pay for your flight tickets accommodation uh you know two weeks of language school uh we are gonna give you a number you can call in case you get lost and if your mom wants to come to see you uh yeah once once during the program she can we will give you a hundred euros type in for that right that's that's an offer that i think assures the person choosing the program that yes i can do that even though i you know can cook my own dinner okay hugo so um coming uh to what you said before in our very first episode of our podcast the pilot one we said that one of our problems may be the unlimited opportunities and chances we have in this world as millennials that having so many options and maybe so much uh, to choose from could maybe demotivate us or we can simply be saturated by these possibilities Uh, so Hugo, do you think that the abundance of possibilities makes it hard for us to choose or do you think this is not true no i don't think that's true no no But I, i don't no i don't think the issue is the abundance of possibilities i think the issue is that that, that the market right that the possibilities that exist are either not well presented to the people that would be interested or are hard for them to 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 pursue because of where mm. the person is in terms of socioeconomic status yeah mm. but i i think it's a it's more of a you know like like from the perspective of our generation as such as a whole you know like uh, as millennials i think if if the previous or generation of our parents was uh, or the boomers were presented the opportunity to go abroad everybody would jump on and like go i think so you know like if they had such an abundance of possibilities maybe they wouldn't be saturated or they wouldn't be Uh, at this at the point where it's like yeah whatever I can do whatever I want whenever I want you know like uh maybe maybe we're just passing on on uh or yeah hard pass on opportunities that otherwise would would be really appreciated uh maybe that's where we were heading with it yeah but that's that's that comes back to the fact that in their time this was forbidden mm. and there is very you know there's even a saying forbidden fruit tastes the best forbidding something is is a very effective way of getting people to pay attention to it mm. so it's in a form of very in a way a very effective form of marketing um because the word spreads really quickly that you can't do something 
But yeah, exactly like you said, when you can do things, you are not as quick to realize that you can and take advantage of what you can do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that comes to what you said. That it's about also the form of presenting it. Yeah, people. because mm -hmm. because in France, if if someone asks you at the uni, like, are you going to abroad? Like, do you want to go? Everybody's jumping for this opportunity, and we're just fighting for everything. I, I when I was in France, I was I was always fighting for uh, for the opportunity to go abroad. And here, like as the example, as you said, Denise, I think I would just have it like this, you know, like I, I wouldn't need to do anything. Yeah, because there's there's a big competition also yeah. in the Netherlands, you know, like there was a huge competition for for uh, when when they were uh, offering exchanges. And uh, for example, we we had a exchange program with one of the LA law schools, and uh, mm -hmm. there was a huge competition for for those uh, those positions because they were taking into consideration so many things. And I I know people who were working hard from year one just to get the best GPA in order to get to the to the LA uh, law school. At UWC, students from almost 190 countries graduate every year. Or you said 70 countries per uh, per college. Uh, after that, where do they go? Or, or tell me, where did you go after you graduated? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people go to uh, major international hubs for universities, mostly because that the environment is very similar to, to UWC, but also because the quality of education is good and the schools recognize UWC, let's say, uh, alumni as, as um, beneficial for, for the universities. So, so a lot of people go to um, the UK, the US, continental Europe, uh, different metropolis, metropoli, <laughs> or different big cities in Asia, Singapore, Hong Kong, yeah, so so people go to to kind of a variety of schools. I decided to go. Well, I decided to try to go to the U.S., uh, United States, and um, all because I wanted a bit more, let's say, communal uh, education. So, what I mean by that is a university that focuses on building a community of the students on on campus instead of a university that is, say big and that um, you know you go to your lectures during the day but then you are kind of away from the universities uh, in the evening okay uh, so Hugo we in the high school <laughs> uh, I, I think I already told you this but uh, we in the high school we always thought that you would become like a president or some <laughs> high-class politician <laughs> and here you are I think you would be a great <laughs> president I think <laughs> I think so too I think Slovakia would maybe become much more uh, international maybe not uh, we have great president we would need Perhaps a better prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> so think about that. I agree with that. Yes. <laughs> and please bring Shishka, uh, which is your dog, which in translation means pine cone. <laughs> bring him with the uh, to the office with you, please. Oh, that, definitely. <laughs> but Hugo, so uh, yeah, I'm saying that we always thought that you would become a high class politician. Okay. Because I want to ask you that if you if you decided uh, to study something uh, like political science or what did you actually study in the US? Computer science. So very, very good career for a politician. <laughs> Perhaps, maybe we're going to have e-governance at some point. AI governance. Oh, I mean, Who knows? don't get me started. But uh, <laughs> I will. I have the question ready. <laughs> oh, no. But no, yes, I studied computer science with a minor. So a major, they have the major minor system. So major, the, the thing you focus on, the, your degree, and then minor, the few classes you take on the side that kind of color your degree, let's say, to like uh, to give it a flavor. Um, so I did computer science with a minor in statistics, uh, hence why I now work in, in sort of machine learning, uh, machine learning field. And uh, no, I do not plan a, a career in politics. So just to get it out there. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think you're going to pursue it? No. No? Ah, who knows? I think you will. <laughs> but if so, you got my vote. <laughs> But uh, yeah, Hugo, so uh, did you also study postgrad? No, I only have a bachelor's degree, so unemployable in Slovakia. <laughs> and this, uh, but uh, yeah, but I know why, but maybe, maybe could you explain why, why in your field uh, it's absolutely okay to have, uh, no, I mean, in general, in the Netherlands, 20% of people who graduated with me didn't pursue studies because mm -hmm. it's absolutely okay in, well, in the West. The bachelor's diploma is recognized as a normal, solid educational diploma and 
not much more is uh, necessary. It's not like in Czech Republic or Slovakia where you definitely need a master's. Mm -hmm. But uh, but you have a different reason why didn't you pursue postgrad, mm -hmm. which I found really interesting. Uh, and it relates to, to your field of uh, expertise. Could you maybe elaborate on that a little? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, the field of machine learning moves forward so quickly, it's uh, hard for the private industry to, to, to catch up. Uh, and it's even harder for universities to catch up. Um, you know, academia is historically pretty slow moving. And um, yeah, so, the, so yeah, the education is obviously good. Uh, the, the postgraduate courses that focus on machine learning or tech are obviously valuable. Um, but, but yeah, for me, it wasn't a requirement or it wasn't something that would be crucial in order for me to start my career and sort of advance in it for up to I think a reasonable level. It's kind of interesting because I I think if they if they came up with a textbook for machine learning within three months it would be already outdated. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I mean that's that's just my 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 very simple perspective, but uh, I I imagine that that is how it is at the moment. Yes, uh, and and it's good to clarify that it's not because everything changes every three months, but but it's because the, the research that comes out. Uh, of mostly private companies funding their own research and the kinds of applications that they discover, uh, that's the part that moves really quickly. Um, the, the theory itself, you know, a lot of it is based in advanced statistics and, and, and linear algebra and, and mathematics in general. So obviously that's, it's been around for a while, a lot of those things. But it's the, it's the applications that, yeah, that change very quickly. Okay, so this is interesting because you said that uh, many of those applications are a result of a, of a private research and mm -hmm. pri privately funded research. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there should be maybe some degree of transparency? Do you think that maybe this should not be all within the patent secret or, you know, like uh, intellectual property protection? Do you think that maybe there is there is like like I'm I'm heading to the point where I'm I'm thinking that maybe the general society would could be benefiting much more if if this uh this information would be communicated or how is it I I don't know maybe maybe the industry communicates it among themselves I don't know maybe you could shed more light into this. So I think there is a good degree there's a st there's still a way to go for sure but I can tell you that that uh, the situation is a lot better nowadays a lot of the research that comes out of Google um, Facebook. Uh, Microsoft, their respective AI labs is published um, for free on the RxI. Uh, it's kind of a popular page for research papers. But is there some kind of authority? Okay, so this is very backwards thinking. I realize, but also <laughs> I'm a lawyer, so you have to you have to realize that I'm a lawyer and I always centralize everything. Hmm. Uh, but is there is there maybe some kind of uh, authority that can that is is uh, saying like this is correct piece of information, this is not correct piece of information, or is this self regulatory that the that the players in the market kind of uh, can evalu evaluate which is the which is the valuable piece of information and which is not? Yeah, that yeah exactly that's how it is, um, and it's like that because um, well because the research moves so quickly and there is not not even time for peer review, which is like the standard of research papers is you get you know the peer review. Um, which is kind of acts like the authority, right? So other people in your field, experts, ideally check your research and say, you know, yeah, this is actually interesting and valuable, or they say, well, this is kind of, this works for you, but it's not really a contribution to the body of knowledge uh, that humanity holds. Um, so I, I don't know the level of how, the degree of how many are peer reviewed, but a lot of what I read is, yeah, like a, you know, fresh out of the oven papers that are not even published yet or that are just a PDF that someone, that the author posted on Twitter or uh, someone tweeted saying, look, this just came out of Google Brain and uh, it's a research paper that you can read. So no, no central authority. It's just, uh, maybe it's a little tricky, you know, if nobody's verifying the quality of the information and uh, anybody can publish anything. Do you think that there is a, there is a certain degree of risk? Yeah, but of course, the the public is the judge or the professional community. Um, so if it if it's if the paper is not good, then no one will end up using it. Um, and if someone you know the people who use it, then there is a lot of code reuse, which is kind of unique about s software development. We we kind of use and reuse a lot of 
other people's code. Um, and so, yeah, the good papers make it to the most popular, um, let's say, code tools, and then everyone uses those good papers. Uh, look, so open source codes, it's kind of like UWC. You're just working on the similarity <laughs> coming from one source and not focusing on differences. <laughs> good point. Let's ease up a little bit. And I'm, I don't think I'm going to make this easy for you. Okay. Hugo, could you, could you explain AI or machine learning or even make a difference because it could be interchangeable, but could you explain AI in few sentences as if we were five years old? Oh, sure. <laughs> Gladly. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so AI is really AI. So artificial intelligence. It's something you should be able to talk to, like you would talk to another human and not know that it's a computer, right? It's a Turing test. That's kind of that's the gold standard. So that's artificial intelligence. It should be intelligent, even though it's artificial. <laughs> Machine learning is just, it's, it's not intelligent. It's a machine that you show a lot of examples and tell it that the next time you see a case of this, compare it with the rest of the examples you have seen and if it matches, then say it's that, otherwise, no. Okay, this was actually very well explained. <laughs> Thank you. It's really stupid, like, you can you show it at 1,000 images of cats and the next time you give it a dog, it says, no, that's not a cat. Okay. But the next time you give it a giraffe, it says it's a cat. But you're like, no, it's a giraffe. But again, it's it's not intelligent. It's just you have shown it a lot of examples, so it can it can find a cat, but it can't. It might not be able to tell a cat, you know, apart from a chihuahua. <laughs> so also, the the quality of machine learning is then based on what you feed it. Exactly, garbage in, mm. garbage out, like we say. <laughs> That's a great saying. I need to remember this. <laughs> garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. Okay. And uh, could you maybe say, uh, just very briefly, what are the advantages and disadvantages of AI? Because I think you're going to have a much more different perspective than me, because I'm, I'm a student of law and technology, and we treat AI from absolutely different perspective, perhaps, mm. than you do, mm -hmm. from a regulatory perspective and uh, blah, 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 legal, boring stuff. But if you had to sum up uh, advantages and disadvantages, what would you say? I think the big advantage that people think is a disadvantage is that it makes humans jobs easier and people think that that's that's because the ai steals your job but it's not true it just changes the nature of your job one example instead of having people stand in a factory looking at uh bottles of uh product coming out with a label and having the person look at every single one of them and check if the label is stuck on correctly if the colors are good you can just put a camera and then a machine learning system to which you show what the correct label looks like, and then it will tell you if some label is incorrect, just like with the cats and dogs and giraffes, right? It can know what's correct. It doesn't need to know that there is 25 other brands of the same thing. It just needs to know what your particular product looks like that's correct. And then the human being doesn't have to stand and, and look at a moving sort of a, a conveyor belt uh, eight hours a day. They can They can move to telling the machine or helping the machine learn what that looks like. They can, you know, they can modify the examples so that sometimes you show the machine, uh, you know, the label, sometimes you kind of write with a pen on the label, sometimes you, you, you kind of, uh, I don't know this word for some reason, you crush the label. Yeah, you just give it, you just make the human give the computer a hard time to learn what it needs to know. So I think that's a big advantage that you, we can spare people, human beings that have so much more potential than this stupid machine learning algorithm. We can make human beings do more meaningful work. The disadvantage is that, is that it picks up on our own biases. It's that um, because our biases reflect in our everyday work, because of the way we make decisions when we hire people, um, because of the way that we pick up on social cues when we email people, because of the way we inherently judge others, because that's how sort of natural selection brought us up, is that we, we judge what's around us constantly, making small decisions about good, bad, threat, safe, stay, go, buy chocolate, buy a drink. So, so this reflects in the biases, so this reflects in the data that we feed the machine learning. And then really unfortunate things happen, like, for example, in the U.S., 
people are getting uh, AI is being used. So machine learning is being used at, at courts uh, to to make automated decisions about people's uh, like fines or jail time or, or, or stuff like that. And exactly, it, it's it's horrible because <laughs> it doesn't take into account the really, really wide societal and judicial context that a human being would if there wasn't like a, yeah, that's a complicated topic. But anyway, so yeah, so the, the big downside is that unfortunately the AI picks up or machine learning just picks up prejudices. This is a scary example you gave, especially in the uh, application of AI in American judicial system, where we well know that some of past American laws have been very racist. That's a pretty good example of uh, the disadvantage yeah. or of the of the dangers of it. Because uh, if you don't control the uh, the input of information for the AI, and somehow a slip, you slip in some racist case, which to this day, there are very racially motivated cases or decisions mm -hmm. or judicial decisions in the U US. This could be very, very dangerous and feed into the di biases, as you said. And it's and it's not just biases. It's also some things we all know, I think, probably from high school or from our education that people inherently find fascinating, uh, but that we have kind of come to, to look down upon, um, which is things like nudity or any kind of like sexual uh, topics, those are just such money makers because people, well, it's an awkward topic for some to talk about, but, but algorithms on social media pick up on that very, very quickly and then recommend you pictures of people who, who, you know, don't have much clothing on. And then people like that because, of course, it's one of the things that, the you know, we as a society in the West, anyway, have come to just be intrigued about, and that tabloids have ab been abusing for so long. Yeah. Um, a very, very primitive nature of our our human human thinking. Yeah, yeah, the most basic instinct. So it it acts like a big amplifier for all these for all these things. And which, I'm, by the way, I'm not saying that nudity is bad in any way. I'm just saying like it's an it's a very good example of how the machine learning system picks up on what human beings in Slovakia consider interesting and naked people are probably one of them. Of course, I think so as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, nudity is not a, it's not bad, but it can be misused. That's the, that's the bottom line. It can be, yeah, for sure. So our podcast is coming to the end, but before we would like to ask you some, some questions about your, your actual life in London. Okay. Because then he told me that you live in London. Mm -hmm. So, do you live alone? No, I do not live alone. With who, if I may ask? <laughs> <laughs> I live uh, very happily married to uh, my amazing wife, um, Ellen. Okay, so you're married. Oh my, oh my God. Okay, so can you please tell us how old are you if you're married? Yeah, I'm 25. Jesus Christ. Yep. <laughs> I need to get my shit together. <laughs> Then it's don't laugh because you don't even have a girlfriend, okay? So <laughs> yes. you too, please get normal. Yeah, fair enough. We gotta get our shit together. <laughs> yes, because I'm just laughing because um, all the time when I see married people or people they're like further in their life, I'm just like, yeah, I need to hurry up because even all my friends like we don't even have boyfriends or girlfriends, you know, like we, we are not at the state of life yet but we are working on it so and hugo uh denise told me that your your wife is american right mm -hmm. okay so you are slovakian she's american and you two live in london quite mm -hmm. a compromise right mm -hmm. uh is your wife learning slovak mm -hmm. she is yes yeah mm -hmm. she's doing very well yeah so if i'm going to talk to her talk to her right now like she can have a dialogue with me or is it like just the basis she can't have a dialogue, but she can describe a few objects to you. Um, she can tell you that she, how she's doing and, um. She can explain you AI in Slovak. <laughs> <laughs> and she can also tell Shishka, right? This is very she can say Shishka, Shishka. exactly. And, and what Shishka <laughs> looks like. And, uh, Hugo, tell me, if you, if you're gonna have a child, do you want it to speak Slovak as well? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Is this something really important to you? Oh, I wouldn't say it's really important. I think it's just the more languages the kid grows up speaking, the better. Um, so yeah, if they get Slovak, English, and some other language right from the sort of 
early, early formative years. Yeah, that would be fabulous. But for me, for example, it's very important because I also don't think that I'm going to have a Slovak wife or, or, or the Slovak life, <laughs> Slovak wife, Slovak life. <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my partner or my, my wife is going to be, uh, extranjera, uh, foreigner. foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's going to be international. Jesus Christ. That's what I'm trying to say. But um, what I want to say is that for me, it's very important that my child speaks Slovak because none of my parents speaks English or any other language, you know, like, the huge part of my uh, family speaks only Slovak. And of course, I would love to have my, my child speak to them and have this, the typical Slovakian childhood, which is so beautiful. I loved growing up in Slovakia and I, I think it's great. Yeah. So I, I, I think I can agree. But we'll go. And I don't want to be sexist. So I, I will, because I, 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 ha- I can read the, the <laughs> okay, I'm going to cut this out, but I'm going to tell you just, just because I find this funny. Because I said, I have this written like, does your wife know how to cook sekedin? <laughs> I don't want to be sexy, so I'm just going to say, in your household, do you guys cook typical dishes, which would be like segedin, brinzáky, perkelt, kološvárska kapusta, kelový prívarek, alebo vineršnicel? <laughs> oh, Out of these dishes, only like one is Slovakian. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and you see yet another ar- argument for why Slovakia is actually a very multicultural place. Yeah. And we, we just we just are so blind to this fact in Slovakia and it's so normal to have yeah Segedin or, or Wiener Schnitzel just be like a normal Slovak thing even though they are a Hungarian and Austrian. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Um no but um we, we don't we haven't cooked any of those to be honest, which I'm kind of taken aback by. What? Um, Denise, turn it off. Turn it off with this episode. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So we are no longer interested in this podcast. Thank you, Hugo. <laughs> Hugo, Sunday dish is Wiener Schnitzel yeah. Kartoffel Salat. <laughs> this Sunday, you, sh- you guys should make Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> make yourself a traditional dish. But has she tried? Has she tried Slovak food? Like yeah, Slovak yeah, food? yeah. No. Every time we are in Slovakia, we eat traditional food. Um, so, yeah, she has had yeah, schnitzel. She has had, uh, I think she has kolosvarska kapusta, of course. Um, <laughs> she has had halushki, <laughs> brinzove, uh, you, know, with, you know, with cheap cheese, also without cheap cheese, with just uh, cabbage and uh, bacon. Um, no, every, every, we even had, you know, steak tartar or tatarski beef tag. All, all the good stuff we definitely always eat. Um, but yeah, in terms of cooking, I, we tend to cook more kind of random stuff. No, 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 no particular cuisine, just whatever is quick and easy. Like fish and um, chips. <laughs> no, no, fish and chips we avoid, but um, we do like to <laughs> buy fish and chips. We don't have a fryer, so it, it's really hard to make fish and chips with a fryer. But no. No, I, I'm just saying that I'm making fun of you, but in, in what, well, I live like eight, nine years yeah. abroad. And in nine years that, or eight years that I'm living abroad, I haven't cooked one s- typical Slovak dish, except for one time when I did Paris Kishalat. <laughs> <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> Hugo, do you know how to change a diaper? Yes. <laughs> oh, oh no, wow! That was on point answer. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Are you training? Yes, I have a niece, one year old. Uh, <laughs> That's amazing. Congrats. Thank you. To your niece. <laughs> yes, I mean, to her, I don't know if she'd congrats. She has a crazy uncle, me. But, uh, you know, congrats to me, to, you know, for having a baby around. She's going to love her ankle. I hope. Ankle? Uncle! I love my ankles. ankles too. I think she likes her ankles, but her uncle, hopefully, she will like as well. I, I believe so. Okay, Hugo. So, in this podcast, you said that 10 years ago, it's been 10 years ago. Mm, it's almost, been 10 years, yeah. Uh, this old post uh, sovietic cork board <laughs> in slovakia changed your life but looking back at those 10 years mm. how do you how do you see it oh looking back i um uh, ooh, that's a that's a loaded question because it, it it makes me sad in some ways because i see how fast the leaders of the the let's say western world are coordinating on major problems and how Slovakia consistently does not 
fully engage in in the capacity that it could so i'm a bit sad about that and i'm a bit sad about the lack of understanding that the introduction of or a lot of people's the dream that a lot of people had in slovakia to be a part of europe and to be a part of the eu and to be a part of international organizations was not the implementation of that dream has not been finished because people have not had the chance to actually experience why to see the proof of why that kind of system is actually better than the system people have in Russia or the system people have in other non-democratic countries. I think it's a major failing uh, that is on the Slovak government, but it's also on the EU government. Um, and uh and sort of the general rise of the the let's say the far right uh, and i really don't mean that in the sense of like squashing political dialogue because because i'm totally fine with political dialogue but but anti-democratic forces uh are not part of political dialogue they are against the dialogue and the dialogue is uh crucial to yeah so i'm, I'm just sad to to see not much engagement from Slovakia and on the international sphere, uh, despite having a major advantage of being a small country where you can make changes really quickly, which you can see with banking, like Slovakia's banking features from, uh, like, I, I, I'm no, no supporter of Tatra Banka, but Tatra Banka has some pretty amazing, like, AI powered features that they can cash out of a bank account without the card scan your phone or whatever with the ATM. Like these things you don't get here or in the US. They still use checks in the US. Can you believe it? Paper checks. So nothing wrong. Well, there's a lot of wrong with that. But um, <laughs> but that's another topic. So anyway, there's just so much potential in Slovakia that, that you can, you know, fully utilize because it's a small country. You can make changes like this and and actually do a lot of cool stuff. Um, so yeah, so I'm a bit I'm a bit sad looking back, but um, but I also you know kind of see maybe the way forward, and there is a lot of people trying to put you know move forward, and um, I I try to get better, but really I want to say one thing, which is that all throughout this conversation I really haven't considered myself like I told you like particularly talented or particularly bright or or. or even particularly su successful, to be honest, but but I do consider myself very very lucky that I have found an amazing partner, Ellen, and uh, and that that I could marry her because um, she is really she is really a huge positive influence in my life. So I did want to get that out. Cute. That's amazing. Mm. This took this took different uh, turn than yeah. I expected, but it it was a it was a great sum up. And uh, no, but uh, maybe we can slowly end where we started with Milan Rastislav Stefanik, who once said in his letter to his parent, uh, to his father, I think it was. I'm not sure, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna mislead. But he said that Slovaks are hardy. Slovaks are trying. They're they're grinding. They're hustling, and they're 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 trying to be better. And even more than a hundred years ago, he could tell that the Western nations had a little bit of advantage because. When you come somewhere and you tell you're French at the time, everybody would know yes. a lot about France. Mm -hmm. But when you came somewhere, just like Milan Rastislav Stefanik did, and he was everywhere, and you said, like, you're from Slovakia, people didn't know. So you had to try twi as, twice as hard. And yeah, you just had to grind through and uh, and reach it. That is, so, that is, you're talking about Stefanik, but it, it happened to me uh, four years ago when I was in the U.S., so I, I was walking with a French guy and we met an American guy. He was like, yeah, guys, where, where do you come from? And my French uh, friend, he was like, I come from France. And I said, I come from Slovakia. He was like, mm, how's Paris? <laughs> <laughs> so like he didn't, he didn't care about me. He was like, okay, like what's this country? I don't know anything about it. So it's, I, I feel like sometimes it's still the same. Like people, they don't know what's Slovakia. But it, that, that's actually an advantage and a disadvantage. Because on one hand, yes, no one knows anything about Slovakia and and on on sort of the grand scheme of things. But it also means that there is nothing really that anyone knows negative about Slovakia. And the you know the socialist rule is mostly I think perceived as a historical thing by now. People are not particularly you know they kind of think of it as the the nineties stuff, the stuff in the twentieth century. Yeah. 
but they know that Slovakia now is a you know democratic country with mm. with you know a very good standard of living. So they don't know anything really good or bad, and it's I think the opportunity that Slovakia has to come on the international international stage and say you know look. We might have been closed off for a really long time, but, you know, exactly like you said, we, we know how to hustle. Uh, we, we, you know, are hardworking people. Uh, people make an effort. There, and then, you know, we're not going to lie. There is a lot of problems, but there, but those problems can be fixed. And um, I just wish that the government, the governing parties would have an interest in fixing the things. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the, that's my beef. <laughs> That's my beef too, and that was very well put. Also, since people don't know shit about Slovakia, you can just come up with whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's gonna call you out on it, you know. You can just say whatever. <laughs> yeah, we have pink unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Hugo. So we're coming to the end. Last question. We ask this question to every single guest okay. of ours in this podcast. Hugo, what would you recommend to read, watch, or listen to to our listeners? Would you get Uh, would you recommend getting married? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would. I would recommend to. Um, I would recommend. <laughs> actually, this is. I've been thinking about this for for. But I've thought about this before. I think it would be great if people could watch a Slovak TV series with English subtitles called Panelak. <laughs> and hear me out on why. I think this is a really unconventional thing to say, but I think Panelak really em- embodies a lot of Slovak culture in, in many good ways and many bad ways. Panelak being a concrete tower block um, of, of bu- building that has like a hundred flats in a sort of six or seven floors, maybe ten floors. And, you know, you, you get all of the bits that are typical to Slovak culture. Like you get a lot of nosy people who are like really want to know what their neighbor is up to. You get a lot of people who are uh, like just super active in their Well, some people who are super active in their in their like building, you have some sort of a shop uh, under the building that there's always some kind of drama going on, and uh, so I think again, yeah, I think it's um, and it does have also some diversity, which is important to talk about. That you know, Slovakia, it's not just white people; um, it is people of different colors as well, and that they are just as much a part of the country as as you know the three of us are. So yeah, you, you see, you see more of the day-to-day life and that sort of genuine interactions people have. So yeah, I mean, if, if you can find it, I think there is some that have English subtitles, but um, probably <laughs> not. You can just get a glance. That's perhaps the most interesting recommendation we've got. Yeah, 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 yes. <laughs> Hugo, thank you so much for this. It was really nice to talk to you. I always like talking to you. Same. I always liked talking to you and I can't wait to have a beer in Slovakia, maybe in, maybe this summer even. Me too. We... All, all throughout these years, yeah, talking to you, Dennis, has been just amazing. So thank you both for, for having me on and uh, it's been a yeah, real fun time. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you. So, thanks guys for listening. We hope you enjoyed our third international episode and maybe learned something new about Slovakia, Slovak millennials or AI. In case you didn't like our third episode or you would like to suggest us what we can do better, please let us know at millennials.podcasty at gmail.com. The fourth international episode is already cooking in our millennials kitchen, so do not forget to follow millennials podcast on our social media. You can find our podcast Millennials on platforms like Podbean, Google Podcasts, Spotify and others. This podcast is made in cooperation with Theatre Falangir and we would like to take this opportunity to say hi to our fellow actors and actresses. So, see you next time. Yeah, right. Poďme na to. Okay. <laughs>